Hello everyone, I'm David from Hong Kong. I'm a registered nurse. I come from a background of inter intensive care unit from a trauma center in Hong Kong. I'm today's speaker. I will hold this webinar with you today. So, these are the three learning objectives I will go through with you today. First of all, I will go through a little bit of basic powerful physiology of ICP with you. And then I will focus on the management of intracranial hypertension as recommended by American College of Surgeons. In between, I will share some nursing consideration of patients with ICP. So, let's start off to the webinar. First of all, for the basic powerful physiology part, the anatomy. I'll just go for a little bit of them so have you just provide you a little bit briefing clinical background of ICP. First of all, we have to always bear in mind that the skull is a fixed with a bony box that contain, you can see, 80% of total volume of brain, 10% of total volume of blood, 10% of total volume of cerebral spinal fluid, CS, CSF. The skull, the main function of the skull, provide a protection to our brain. The brain comprises 2% of body weight, 20% of oxygen consumption and 25% of Google's demand. So about ICP. The very important part is that the skull is which is secured the holes and the skull cannot easily accommodate any additional volume. The principles of ICP monitoring it is that ICP reflects the dynamic relationship between the intracranial contents, the blood, the brain, and the CSF, and the powerful physiology that may exalt its compensatory mechanism. And here's the very famous hypothesis. A more clearly decline. It provides the framework for managing and treating conditions that cause in increased ICP. And it provides the basics of ICP. It states that the sum of the intracranial volume of blood brain cells have is always a constant, and any increase in any one of these must be offset by an equal decrease in another, or else the pressure rise. An increase in pressure caused by expanding intracranial volume is distributed evenly throughout the intracranial cavity. Here's some example. The far left is in normal circumstances. 80% of brain, 10% of blood, 10% is CSF. And the ICP is inside the normal range, 10 millimercury. In the middle one, there is a mass occupied lesion. And the blood and the CSF get shunted out. The brain is compensating, and the ICP is just mildly increased. It's just 15 minute mercury. However, if the mass further increase for additional mass, the brain become uncompensated. The ICP will further increase. You can see the blood and the CSF cannot be further shunt, and the ICP increased rapidly. The relationship between the volume inside the brain, inside the skull, between, with, with the pressure inside the skull, is called compliance. The relationship between the volume and the pressure is called compliance. And the relationship of them is shown in this curve. The pressure will remain static thanks to the autoregulation system of brain arterial. If the volume increased it, just very small, the intracranial pressure will not be very, very extremely increased. It remains static. However, if the CSF of any other substance further increased in volume, and despite having reached the point of exhaustion, the intracranial pressure will rise rapidly, as you can see in the curve. Volume compensatory mechanism 
we train the exhaustion. The brain will be compressed or squeezed out by increased ICP, in resulting in possible neural defect or deep death. And is it the relationship between the intracranial volume and intracranial pressure? So, the importance of ICP we can consider as a two path. The left one is just intracranial hypertension, direct squeezing out the brain tissue, leading to brain herniation and death. And the other part is with decreased the cerebral blood flow. The blood supplying the brain tissue is decreased and leading to cerebral ischemia is also leading to will lead to very poor neural outcome. And to concern about the perfusion of the brain, we can have the cerebral perfusion pressure. It is defined as the difference between the mean arterial pressure and ICP. It is a pressure to ensure the blood flow to the brain. The normal range is 17 to 100 millimercury. So less than 15 millimercury is associated, associated with ischemia resulting in neural death. It is a very critical parameter for brain function and survival. So, what causes increased ICP? First one is cerebral edema, and the second one is traumatic brain injury, induced masses. Most of the masses is hematoma, epidural hematoma, subdural hematoma, angioparenchyma hematoma, or dispressed skull fracture. Hydrocephalus due to obstruction of CSF absorption or circulation. Of course, will increase the CSF volume. Hypoventilation. Hyperventilation will lead to hypercapnia. Hypercapnia will lead to vasodilation. That will increase the cerebral blood flow. That will increase ICP. Systematic hypertension. Of course, we increase the cerebral blood flow. That will increase ICP. Agitation will increase the blood pressure and increase ICP. Brain tumor, of course, there's a mass lesion. Acacephalus or meningitis, there's infection of the brain, will lead to maybe cerebral edema. So these are the causes of increased ICP. And a traumatic brain injury account for about 1.7 million new cases annually in the US. So here is some CT image I will share with you. Here is a CT image with a tumor inside the skull. The second one is the brain tissue is swelling, edema. Third one is there is a large amount of bug inside the skull. And the last one is enlarged ventricle. You can see CSF anomaly. So, after we know the ICP level, what they can tell us, for the normal range, 5 to 15 millimercury, this is common consensus. From the, for the ICP between 20 to 25, it will make you require treatment. For 20 to 30 millimercury, they will consider as intracranial hypertension. For ICP larger than 40, they will consider as severe and life threatening. And in the fourth edition of Traumatic Brain Injury Guideline, published in 2016, treating ICP larger than 22 is recommended. Just imagine you are a nurse now, an ICU nurse now. There's newly admitted a patient with traumatic brain injury from a motor vehicle accident Beating control and cord evacuation were performed for patient. ICP monitor was used. They inserted ICP catheter inside the skull of patient to monitor the ICP level. And the GCS is still remain three points with sedation in progress. Of a patient was intubated with mechanical ventilation. So, what can you provide for patient? What is the nursing care you could deliver for the patient? Of course, uh, we have to do a basic assessment of the patient. We do it every shift, 
after handover. ABC is what? Airway, briefing, and circulation. We have to ensure the patent airway for patient, maintain a good oxygenation and adequate ventilation for patient, maintain adequate organ perfusion for patient. We have to monitor the heart rate, the blood pressure, human output, and body temperature. Moreover, we also have some nursing diagnosis for neurosurgical patients. We use nursing diagnosis to help the nurse determine the problem of patient and help them with related nursing intervention. These are the three very common nursing diagnoses for these patients. First of all is ineffective cerebral perfusion related to increased ICP. Our target is to maintain the adequate of cerebral perfusion pressure. And the second way is ineffective airway currents related to decreased level of consciousness. So we have to determine the patient required the needs of mechanical ventilation or they are receiving enough oxygen. And the third one is hyperthermia. Fever is very common among these patients and injury to hypothalamus may alert the control of body temperature. Fever is very important to control to be controlled in these patients. This will increase the oxygen consumption inside the brain, will decrease the supply to the brain tissue, actual tissue. So we have to consider it. So we come to the general nursing care on this patient. First of all, of course, we have to monitor vital sign, as we mentioned before to maintain to ensure an adequate organ perfusion for this patient. And the second, we will perform neuro neurological assessment regularly to see any change in neurological level, including the GCSE, pupil size and reactions, ICP and CPP, and any convulsion observed. Regular GC assessment, oh, of course, always and we must alert for any abnormal behavior, sudden agitation. If the, per, if the patient complain of sudden severe and persistent headache, we must also be aware of it. It may, it may, it, it may indicate some new or involving neurological symptom inside the skull. If the patient suffer from seizure attack, we have managed the patient to prevent the injury. And also, if the patient has ICP, also have the EVD inside, we have to use the EVD to control the ICP according to a doctor's prescription to maintain a adequate cerebral perfusion. The care of EVD include the drainage of CSF, to lower the ICP as prescribed it, and maintain a UVD level as prescribed the level, avoid kinking and the bending of the system, observe the site and the CSF color and clarity. If the CSF color is certain, train it to butt like, fresh butt like, we have to aware that they are inside bleeding inside the patient's skull and closely monitor the ICP and the CPP level. That's if the ICP was higher than the doctor prescribed level, we, we can open the UED to draw some CSF out to lower the ICP level. We have to closely monitor the also ICP waveform. It will tell us the compliance of the ICP, the, the, the compliance of the brain. And also, we have to monitor the fruit and electrolyte to prevent DI, diabetic insipitus, and also the SIHDH, the symptom of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, and also salt wasting. They are very common for patients with injury the brain, so we have to ensure the electrolyte inside the patient is normal. Otherwise, there are a lot of complications will come over. And also, we also have to observe for complications and treat it properly, just like vasospasm and with bleeding. 
and also page for patient with ventil ventil ventilator care with ventilator with ventilator we have we have to provide the ventilator care bundle um the six point other ventilator care bundle including pop of the patient to 30 degree mouth profile regular mouth care and also we ask the doctor to prescribe shred outside prophylaxis and also the DVT prophylaxis maybe sedation holiday is needed and also we have to perform regular sputum suction and of course we have to provide psychological support to patient and the relatives so but if sudden look we've increased the ICP what can we do for the patient well, first of all we have to know that what are the signs symptoms of increased ICP these are the signs and symptoms of increased ICP including the certain degrees in the GCSC or level of consciousness certain hypertension polydemia hypertension may be related to to the headache of patient uncomfort of patient and also cousin try it I will go for it it is a very late side of increased ICP and also maybe certain change of pupil size fixed dilated or equal pupils certain motor defeat and also patient complaint of headache and certain vomiting especially projectile vomiting nausea allergy Mm, these are the examples of unequal size of people and dilated pupils. We have to be aware of it, so we have to perform regular regular neurological assessment. So we'll talk about little about cushing triad. It is a reflex indicating ICP is extremely high. If patient in this stage is not treated properly, brain herniation will soon occur. In the first stage, the increase in ICP will compress the arterial vessel inside the brain and causing decreased blood perfusion towards the brain and leading to ischemia. This ischemia will trigger a CSF ischemia response inside the brain and the response will cause peripheral vessel constriction, constriction and increase in cardiac out output. So the systolic pressure will first increase first to a very high level, for example, 180 millimercury for, for systolic pressure. And in the second stage, the increase in systolic blood pressure will detected by bell receptor in the cardon acaloidic bodies. The parasympathetic reflex will be triggered and the heart rate will be decreased, leading to bradycardia. At the first stage, if the ICP is further increased and the respiratory center inside the medulla is further compressed and leading to irregular breathing pattern. This is patient's the last effort to maintain an adequate cerebral perfusion. If the patient in this state is not treated properly, soon the patient will die. So how can we handle this patient before it's getting too late? There are a lot of literature review, study, discussion among among this academic world in the neurosurgical side. The Brain Trauma Foundation, they will review the study regularly to recommend, to have recommendations for doctors on how to manage brain injury patients. And also, there are also some trauma quality improvement program as recommended by American College of Surgeons on how to manage traumatic brain injury. They are all concerning the secondary injury caused by increased ICP. So, um, as recommended by Brain Trauma Foundation, Using information from ICP monitoring is always recommended to reduce in, ho in hospital and to risk post injury mortality. And as I mentioned before, treating patients with ICP less than 22 is recommended. Today, I will focus on 
on the Trauma Quality Improvement Program from American College of Surgeons. They're using tier approach, three tier approach. Higher tiers reflect more intensive management that is associated with increased complication. Failure to control ICP within one tier should prompt progression to next tier treatment option. As we always have to bear in mind as a, kid, as a clinician, there's no single powerful physiological pathway of ICP elevation. The management is complex. We have to focus on more than just the ICP level. Also, the history of patient, the mechanism of injury of patient. They will give hints to how to manage this patient. And also, repeat CT imaging is new and neurological exam should be always considered to rule out any development of lesion. If there is sudden bleeding, no matter what can you do, ICP level is still high, we have to know that the size of the blood count and always treat them with surgical intervention. So, a lot of treatment we can consider. However, I will focus on the three tier approach today. The first tier, always bear in mind that the first recommendation, the management in the first tier, should be as a routine. We should always do this for the patient with I with ICP. Positioning. They can promote the venous return. We pop up the patient. We have the head or back elevated at 30 degrees. And the second one is sedation and energetic. Continuous sedation to facilitate mechanical ventilation along with immediate admission to ICU is a safe action as recommended by studies. We can use short acting agents, example propofol, fentanyl, and midazolam in intubated patients. But however, we have to closely monitor, also closely monitor, on patient hemodynamic under the effect of sedation. The blood pressure, the blood pressure of the patient, may maybe not stay stable. It's getting too low. The blood pressure is getting too low. We have to also maintain the organ perfusion of the patient. So we may consider the doses of how to using the sedation and also we have to consider is there any needs of using inotropes. And also in the first tier, we have to maintain a normal body temperature. Our target is maintain a 36 to 37 degrees Celsius. We also have to consider if there is fever of curd we have to consider the administration of Panadol as the minofam for fever. We have to also, if there is shivering of curve, for there is high fever shivering of curve, we have to active cool, cooling the patient because shivering can cause up to 400 increase in oxygen demands in this patient. As I mentioned before, if there is UVD present, drink it according to a doctor's prescription. The, according to doctor prescription, drain the CSF out to lower the ICP first, as doctor prescribed. This can immediately decrease the volume of CSF and hence decrease the ICP. And also in the first tier, we have to maintain normal f ventilation. Hypoxia must be avoided, and is one of the most important secondary insult to injury the brain. We have to intubate the, the patient if GCS is less than 8 point. We regular perform butt taking observe for the arterial blood gas to maintain a oxygen level with 60 millimercury larger than that. And also a carbon dioxide level between 34 to 38 millimercury. It's about 4.5 to 5 kPa. There's no role for prophylactic hyperventilation. Just maintain the patient with normal ventilation in the first tier. And also, after management of the patient within the first tier, the ICP level may be still higher than 22. We have to get prepared for CT pain. 
for CT imaging. You have to rule out that the development of surgical lesion and guide the next level treatment. So, if the treatment, if the treatment in the first tier is not working, so we come to the second level, the second tier. First of all, is the hyperosmolar therapy. Doctor may prescribe mannitol or hypotonic saline to help reduce the, the edema or swelling of the patient of the brain tissue. They can draw water from the brain tissue, including brain water, into the interstitial and also to the blood plasma. But for the hypotonic saline, we have to consider that this should be avoided if serum sodium is exceeding 155 minimal per liter. If the patient is under the therapy of hypervolemia agent, we have to consider for the same symptom of hypervolemia. Observe for the hemodynamics and also the skin turgor, and is there also the urine output is adequate or not? Accurate document document the intake and also the output. And also inside the second tier. There is a role for hyperventilation. For the first tier, we have to maintain normal ventilation for the patient. But for the second tier, if the recommendation in the first tier is not working, we can consider hyperventilation. It just moderate, keeping the carbon dioxide level between three point five to four kPa. This can reduce ICP through a reduction of cerebral blood flow. Because hypocapnia will leading to vasoconstriction of cerebral vessel and hence decreasing the cerebral blood flow, so ICP decrease. But bear in mind, this is only a short term measure. And also, we also have to assess for for the compliance of the of the brain. We assess the cere cerebral autoregulation. If the patient autoregulation is poor. The cerebral perfusion pressure goal should be lower to reduce ICP, but not less than fifteen millimercury. And also, we can use an other use other additional neural monitoring that could help determine optimal CBP, including the brain tissue oxygenation, cerebral blood flow, and jugular oxygenation. They can help us to determine the optimal CBP because. Higher target of CBP that will increase ICP. If if the recommendation from the first and the second level are still not working, and after CT imaging there is no surgical intervention for this patient, but the ICP is still high, we gladly go to the first tier level to see what what can we do for this patient. The first year, the first one is decompressive craniectomy. As I mentioned in the powerful physiology part, in the first part of the webinar, our skull bone is a secured and rigid box, and cannot easily accommodate accommodate any additional volume. But how about we destroy the box? We we remove a skull bone out from the patient. So the ICP, of course, monocalidocrine is not applying, and the relationship between the volume and the pressure is different, and the ICP will temporarily decrease. And it is only can be performed if treatment is tiers one and two are not efficient or limited by the development of side effect of medical treatment. We have to closely monitor for signs, symptoms of pain, anxiety, and change in the level of consciousness. And also, hemorrhage, hemorrhage is a immediate concern. Besides the surgical treatment, removing a part of the skull bone out, we can also we can use some med medication to induce coma for the patient, the barbiturate, barbiturate coma or propofacoma. These hypnotic agents can depress cerebral oxidative metabolism, enhance lowering the cerebral blood flow and ICP. 
but we have to aware of hypertension as it is a frequent side effect of high dose therapy with this agent. We can also apply continuous EEG to ensure the targeting of the infusion to birth suppression EEG pattern. And also in the first tier, we can consider the therapeutic hypothermia, keeping the body temperature between 33 to 35 degrees Celsius. But remember, the recommendation in the first tier is never recommended as an initial treatment. And especially for the therapeutic hypothermia, it is reserved as a vascular therapy only after reasonable attempts as previous tier 3 treatments have failed. Uh, this is from my research recently in 2017. Um, they are very likely as uh, as this treatment are very likely to those recommended by American College of Surgeon. I pick it out as just as a summary. Um, they are they're using also three tier approach, first level, second level, and the third level. And the first level is very similar to American to what, what I mentioned before positioning, um, maintain a normal vermeer, and also maintain a normal ventilation. If the treatment is not working for lower the ICP, go to the second level, including hyposomolar therapy, and also high therapeutic um, high, hyperventilation to, to lower the carbon dioxide level so as to decrease the cerebral blood flow, and hence decreasing the ICP. And also for the third level is craniotomy or barbiturate coma and therapeutic hypothermia can be considered. So it's just as a summary. But you may ask that mm, this recommendation may be just for, is it just for traumatic brain injury? Oh, I would say it, the answer is not. It is for every patient with injured brain rather than just traumatic brain injury because the most important part is to prevent the secondary injury caused by increased ICP. It is very important part no matter what. What kind of patient it is, if the ICP is increased, the most important part is to prevent the secondary by further increase the of, of ICP. So this is our, my references. Thank you for today for attending this webinar from the World Training Academy. Um, and then I will go to the Q&A section. If you have any question now, you can just feel, feel free to type in the comment bar and I will go through it one by one. And thank you again. And I will come to the question and answer session. And thank you very much.